Neurons are also called nerve fibers. Now remember, most cells in the body are kind of round. Most cells in our body are kind of small, round, cuboidal, columnar. That's the cell shape of most cells. There's a, so they're called cells. There are only two kinds of cells in the body that rather than being kind of round, are long and skinny. And those are nerve cells and muscle cells. And because nerve cells and muscle cells are long and skinny, they're, rather than calling them nerve cells and muscle cells, they're called nerve fibers and muscle fibers. Fiber suggesting that it's long and thin and skinny. Now, both nerve cells and muscle cells exhibit excitability. Excitability is the capacity to generate that electrical current called an action potential. Furthermore, because they're long and skinny, they conduct this electrical impulse along their length. So this action potential or electrical current is conducted along the length of the nerve cell or nerve fiber or muscle fiber. <clears throat> nerve cells and muscle cells are regarded as the most highly specialized cells in the body. And there's a general pattern that the more uh, specialized the cell, the less frequently it undergoes cell division. So in fact, nerve cells and muscle cells lose their ability to undergo mitosis or cell division in an adult. That's why damage and death of nerve cells and muscle cells, including heart muscle, is considered so much more serious than damage or death of uh, other types of tissues in the body. Uh, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, if, uh, if you, I've said this before, I think, if you cut your skin, it grows right back together again. Right? Maybe a little scarring, but it grows back together, you're going to make new skin cells. If there is damage and death to brain cells, that's permanent, irrevocable loss of the brain, and it might be fatal. What's an example where, where somebody has death of brain cells, and it may very well be fatal? You call it a stroke or a cerebrovascular accident, a stroke. Have a stroke, brain cells have died, and it might be fatal. Uh, and what would it be called if somebody uh, damages and causes heart muscle cells to die? That's a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, and that may very well be fatal. So that makes damage and death to, heart, uh, to muscle cells and nerve cells much more serious than damage or death to skin cells or liver cells or even kidney cells can be, it can, can be a, 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 a cause problems, but is not usually fatal. This is almost always fatal. Uh, now, the, uh, to give you a sense of how specialized nerve cells are, you have nerve cells, you have motor neurons that originate in the lower part of the spinal cord and they extend all the way down your leg and control the muscles in your toe. This is a cell that is thinner than a nylon thread. You can't even see it without a magnifying lens. It is thinner than a nylon thread and it may be four feet long. So no wonder they can't divide. We understand how a little round cell can divide and become two cells. But how could a cell four feet long, thinner than a nylon thread, divide and become two cells? It can't. So that's the challenge why these nerve cells can not lose, can no longer divide. Yep. So in the brain, there is never new neurons? It's always the same amount of neurons? It's actually progressively less. You have all the neurons you're ever going to have at the age of two. Oh, yeah? That's it? Yeah, that's it. So that the number you, decreases. Learning, when you're learning, there is no more neurons. Either. No, you form more connections, but you don't have more neurons. You have more connections between the neurons. But you actually have a decrease in number of neurons. Uh, the, uh, so over time, we know that it's much more difficult to learn as we get older, right? Than children, easier, easier. And as we get older, it doesn't mean we can't, but it does take more work because uh, the number of nerves uh, so is declining. Uh, uh, not, so uh, another point I wanted to make, we cannot make more nerve cells or muscle cells, including heart muscle. So this is where somebody usually asks me, well, wait a second. What about bodybuilders, right? They're, they're, they're working out, so now they've got these big muscles. They don't have more muscle cells. 
that made their muscle cells larger. They have hypertrophied or enlarged. And in fact, if they stop exercising, what happens to the size of those muscle cells? They shrink, they atrophy back. But they do not make more. All of us have about the same number of muscle cells in all the muscles of our body. We can make them grow thicker and bigger and stronger. Or if we don't exercise, they become thinner and weaker, but they don't, we don't change the number. Here, under basic structure of a neuron, uh, what is the cell body? What is meant by neuronal processes? The cell body is the area of the neuron where the nucleus is located. That's called the cell body, or soma. And you'll notice that uh, in a nerve cell, there are these extensions coming off the cell body. They may be short, they may be long. These extensions are collectively called neuronal processes. Neuronal processes refers to these extensions coming off the cell body. There are two types of neuronal processes, two types of extensions, dendrites and axons. Dendrites and axons. Now, uh, uh, the uh, dendrites, we wrote, detect stimuli. Yes, sir, what's that? They detect environmental changes. They detect changes. They may be detecting chemicals. They may be detecting temperature. They may be detecting sugar concert levels. They may be detecting uh, pH. They are detecting something in the environment. All right? That's what the dendrites do. The axons conduct action potentials away from the cell body. You can think of axons starts with the letter A. They conduct uh, action potentials away from the cell body. Uh, and the axons terminate in little knobs called synaptic knobs. And when the action potential reaches the synaptic knobs, uh, it causes a re uh, the synaptic knobs to release a chemical called a neurotransmitter chemical. Uh, I also gave the terms axon hillock and axon collateral. And I'll just show you all this on the picture. Now, on the picture, these are the dendrites. They are the dendrites because they functionally detect changes in the environment. And also, they do not terminate. They do not terminate in little knobs. Uh, this structure here is an axon. And uh, it's an axon because it conducts action potentials away from the cell body, as indicated by the arrows. And it terminates in these little knobs called synaptic knobs. When the action potential, when this electrical current reaches the knobs, it causes the release of a chemical called a neurotransmitter. We're going to be learning all about these neurotransmitters. You've heard the names before. They go by names like dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin. And that's the name of these neurotransmitter chemicals that we'll be learning about. I want to emphasize that why this is an axon and why these are dendrites is not related to how long they are. <coughs> there are dendrites that are as long or longer than axons. Furthermore, what makes these dendrites and this an axon has nothing to do with the fact that these have myelinating cells wrapped around them. There are dendrites that have myelinating cells. So they're not defined based on their length or their, whether they have myelinating cells, a, a myelin covering around them or not. They're based on Structurally, whether they have knobs at the end, if they don't, they are dendrites. If they do, they're axons, and their function, and their function. Um, now, the first part of the axon is right where it comes off is known as the axon hillock. I don't think that that's that important to know. And then sometimes we have branches, branches off the main axon, uh, known as axon collaterals. Collateral is a branch. Notice that in this example where uh, the axon does have myelinating cells, uh, notice the nodes of Ranvier, the little gaps between the myelinating cells that will become important as we go on. Uh, I'll also remind you, we covered this earlier today, that uh, when we have myelinating cells wrapped around interneurons in the central nervous system, the myelinating cells are called oligodendrocytes, or oligodendroglial cells. 
But when there are myelinating cells wrapped around sensory neurons or motor neurons in the peripheral nervous system, then those myelinating cells are called Schwann cells. So what they're called, whether they're called oligodendrocytes or Schwann cells, has to do with whether they are wrapped around inner neurons in the central nervous system or around sensory neurons or motor neurons in the peripheral nervous system. Now, on the, uh, okay. uh, on the next page, it shows some of the variations in the shapes of neurons. Neurons really show more variation in shape and size than about any other type of cells in the body. They really vary tremendously. Uh, in this first neuron on your left, here's the cell body where the nucleus is. And you'll notice there are how many neuronal processes coming off the cell body? Two. One, two. And that's why it's called a bipolar-shaped neuron. Bi means two. A bicycle has two wheels. This is a bipolar-shaped neuron. I want to emphasize this has nothing to do with a psychiatric condition of being manic depression or bipolar. It has nothing to do with that. We're referring to or describing the shape of this neuron, bipolar. Now, it's obvious that this is the axon because it terminates in little knobs. And so the axon we defined as conducting an action potential away from the cell body, and, uh, and it, it terminates in knobs. And when this uh, electrical current called an action potential reaches the knobs, it will cause the release of a neurotransmitter. Notice it is covered by myelinating cells. Now, uh, the, the, then the question is, well, what do we call this? And I guess this whole thing would be called a dendrite. Uh, the books have a lot of difficulty being consistent with these definitions of dendrites and axons because we have so many variations in sh a, a shape of neurons that sometimes it's very difficult to actually give a clear, precise definition uh, where there's no exceptions. Uh, some books might just call the very ends dendrites. I would tend to call the whole thing a dendrite. Because right here, first of all, this, these do not have knobs at the top. Can't be an axon. And the action potential is moving here, actually, in the direction of the cell body. But some books do call this entire thing an axon. Um, the, uh, now, where do we find neurons that look like this? These are found uniquely in the retina of the eye. In the retina of the eye. And the retina of the eye is, the, the uh, eye is really a, an extension of your brain. It actually develops from the brain. Uh, We'll talk more about those bipolar shaped neurons when we get to visual physiology. Now, the middle picture is very, very important. This neuron shown in the middle is what most sensory neurons look like. Not all, but most. Most sensory neurons look like this. Now, this is the cell body where the nucleus is. How many neuronal processes are coming off this? One. Just one. And then it divides, it bifurcates into two, but only one comes off. Because only one comes off, that's why this is labeled a unipolar-shaped neuron. Unipolar. Uni means one. There's only one neuronal process, and then it divides. Now, this neuron, though, does create a real problem of what to call these things. Uh, we clearly understand this is an axon. It terminates in knobs. It's conducting the action potential away from the cell body. Up here, these are clearly dendrites. There's no knobs. But the question is, do we just call these ends dendrites, or do we call the whole thing a dendrite all the way to here? And again, a lot of, I would tend to call this whole thing a dendrite here, but many books will call this whole thing a, a, an axon. Uh, I'm not going to give you a test question. We're going to try to catch you on that. I'm pointing out that there is variations in uh, how books deal with this. All right, and then this third picture, this neuron, which really looks identical to the neuron pictured on the previous page, this has many neuronal processes coming off the cell body. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, many. And that's why it's called a multipolar shaped neuron. Now, this one here is an axon because it terminates in knobs. So it conducts the action potential down its length, and when that action potential reaches the synaptic knobs, it causes the release of a neurotransmitter. These are called dendrites. They're dendrites because they don't have knobs. 
But again, I want to emphasize that this idea of dendrite and axon is based on whether they have knobs or not, not based on their length, not based on whether they're myelinated. Uh, in this picture, oh, oh, and why this shape is really important is that all motor neurons look like this. Without any exception, all motor neurons, both somatic and autonomic motor neurons, have this shape, and many interneurons look like this. Interneurons are the neurons in the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. Uh, in uh, this picture right here, it just shows an enlarged view of the synaptic knob. When that action potential or nerve impulse uh, is conducted into the knob, it's going to cause the release of a chemical. And really, the rest of this we covered last week, but I'll quickly review it with you. We learned that there were three types of neurons functionally, based on their function. Sensory neurons, inner neurons, and motor neurons. One, two, three. Sensory neurons conduct action potentials to the central nervous system, to the brain and spinal cord, providing information in. That's the input signal. They usually have a unipolar shape. We learned that there were two types of sensory neurons, somatic sensory and visceral sensory neurons. Uh, somatic sensory neurons transmit information from the skin and skeletal muscles to the central nervous system, and the information reaches consciousness. You're aware of it. Visceral sensory neurons transmit information from our internal organs to the central nervous system, and the information usually does not reach consciousness. We're not usually aware of it. Interneurons are found entirely within the central nervous system. They are used for thinking, memory, and decision making, and they commonly, not always, but commonly have a multipolar shape. Motor or efferent neurons conduct action potentials from the central nervous system to the effector organs of our body. <clears throat> and they cause an effect. And they are sending commands to these uh, organs, to our skeletal muscles, to our heart, to our stomach, to our sweat glands, to our salivary glands. They always have a multipolar shape. And on page 36, there were two types of motor neurons we learned, somatic motor neurons and autonomic motor neurons. Somatic motor neurons permit voluntary control of our skeletal muscles, whereas autonomic motor neurons provide automatic, involuntary control of our internal organs. So we summarized this last week not only by looking at this drawing, but also by looking at this chart. So we'll just remind you of the chart. We divide our nervous system into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord, and what's inside of our brain and spinal cord? Inner neurons, used for thinking, memory, decision making. What is the PNS, the peripheral nervous system? All these nerves, all the nerves branching off the brain and spinal cord. They're going out to the periphery, to the sides of our body. What's inside these cranial and spinal nerves? Sensory neurons or afferent neurons bringing information into the central nervous system and motor or efferent neurons sending commands out to the effectors. There are two types of sensory neurons and two types of motor neurons. 